Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining. Uh, we started a couple minutes early, so I'm just going to give everybody a few minutes to, to filter in, uh, and we'll get started right at 12. Yeah. Are you monitoring the chat box, Liz? Yes, I will. I'll monitor the chat and the questions. Feel free to, to start posting in there. Yeah, maybe they could. Uh, maybe people could post um, or chat where they're from. Yeah, What's we're all fun? here in Charlottesville, Virginia. So let's hear where you're from. Michigan, Vegas, another Vegas, Minnesota, Some more Michiganers. Yeah, so we're getting the upper Midwest here. <laughs> now we've got Florida. Okay. Maine. Oh man, we've got just about everywhere. Kentucky, Georgia. Mother Maine. New Hampshire, North Carolina, Oklahoma. <laughs> oh, we really are. We are, we are definitely now getting across the country. That's great. Nebraska, Florida, Chicago, DC, Georgia. South Florida, Arkansas. I like that Florida is, they have to, you know, they all say Florida or South Florida. It's the only state where I used to do the same thing uh, from Rochester, New York. And when you say New York, people picture only one part of New York. So you have to say Western New York. Vermont, Jacksonville, Tennessee, Nebraska, Ohio. So we got New England, Mid Atlantic. Southeast, Midwest, Upper Midwest. Yeah, lots of people joining, but 9 a.m. So thank you for making us your part of your morning. Thank you. Louisiana, Omaha. All right. Well, I want to be cognizant of everyone's time. So we'll try and get started right on time here. Um, thank you everyone for joining. This is Ask Us Anything, maintaining high quality interactions during uh, this crazy time during COVID-19. So our goal today is to really answer some of the questions that we saw coming through the class learning community most often. Um, we had people submit questions through posts, through emails to me directly, um, and through our Facebook group. And so I compiled all of the sort of most common questions and themes and have them here today. And we'll also save some time at the end to ask um, questions that you, that you have that we don't address. Um, so joining us as our, our experts, we have Heather and Sarah, um, both bringing a wide variety of experience and class certifications and um, time at Teachstone. And so, Heather, do you want to take a second and introduce yourself? Sure. Um, I'm Heather Sasson, and I lead all of our video content work here at Teachstone. Um, I've been here for about three years, and prior to being at Teachstone, I was an observer for three years and also worked as a behavioral therapist for children with special needs. Um, certified on all six age levels of the class tool. And I also worked for about seven years as a preschool teacher. And Sarah. Hi, everybody. Uh, thanks for joining us. Um, I'm Sarah and I have, um, I, I don't even really wanna talk about how many years I've been in the field, but it's um, pushing like 35 years um, in early childhood and early childhood special education. Um, I've been a classroom teacher. Um, I've been an administrator. I've done research. I've been a teacher educator. Um, 16 years ago, I started working with class at the University of Virginia with the initial, um, my teaching partners program, um, which looked at class-based coaching um, done at a distance. So this will be helpful for today. Um, and um, 11 years ago in um, the fall, I will have um, been at, at Teachstone. So one of the originals. <laughs> awesome. Um, so quickly before we get started, we just want to learn a little bit about you and your role. So I'm going to launch this poll. And if you can answer what is your role, are you a teacher, a coach or mentor, an observer, an administrator? or 
something outside of that. And if you're an other, feel free to, to use that um, chat to share. Maybe. So far, a pretty good mix. We have most of the above. Yeah. Uh, 25% teachers, 35% coach or mentor, 16% observers, 15% administrators, 8% other. Good, just another minute. All right, go ahead and close the poll for now, but feel free to chat in if you didn't have a chance. So our final numbers, 27% teachers, 35% coach or mentor, 16% observer, and 14% administrator, and 8%. Okay, so really good mix today. Thank you all for joining. And we really will have questions um, from all of those audiences. And so, uh, We'll try and address the, the concerns of each of that those groups. Um, so briefly, for those of you who might be newer to, to TeachStone and class, uh, TeachStone is the publisher of the class tool. And we work really throughout 50 states and, and internationally as well. Um, this is a picture of our colleague JJ when he was on a, a filming trip in Peru. And um, our goal is to ensure that all students have access to life-changing teachers. Our, our mission is that um, to help every child reach their full potential by measuring and improving the interactions that matter most. Um, and we're located in Charlottesville, Virginia. Another quick poll, and then we'll, we'll, we'll dive in, um, just to try and get a sense of how familiar you are with the class tool. Um, so somewhere on this spectrum, do you not really know much about class? Are you familiar, but you're, you don't use it currently in your work? Do you use the class tool to collect assessment data? Or do you use it to assess and provide professional development? All right, we have a new, few new people. 3% don't know much about class. 8% say they're familiar, but don't use Look at work. We're at 21% use class to collect assessment data and almost 70% use class for assessment and professional development, which is awesome. That's great, yeah. more seconds. Uh, well, those of you who are finishing up, uh, have a question in the chat, will this session be recorded? Yes, it will be recorded. Everyone who registered will get a recording as an email tomorrow, and um, the email will also have a certificate of attendance. You need it for professional development. All right, I'm going to go ahead and close the poll. Move on, but we were at 65% use class for assessment and professional development, 22 uh, collect assessment data, nine are familiar but don't use class at work currently, and 4% are, are pretty new to class. We've got a good range, that's good. All right, so why we're all here, let's get started answering your questions. And um, I'm going to turn my camera off but, uh, so that the experts can be the focus. But um, I will continue to monitor the chat box. And so if you have questions um, that you want to not forget about and submit now, I can look at those at the end when we open up for questions. Or if you have a question about something that they're discussing, um, feel free to 
put it in that chat box. All right, so the first question is really a, a two-part question. Um, and thinking about if, when we return to classrooms, um, so the question was, we're returning and we're told to maintain six feet from students and or wear a mask. What does positive climate or relationship building look like if I can't smile at or sit near or touch the children? And then if that's the case for many of you, um, like how do you keep children at a distance from one another, from, from yourself as the teacher in the classroom? Um, and how do you sort of explain to children that they, they need to do this? So what do you guys think? Yeah, so if you do have to wear a mask and remain six feet away from children, um, even if it's a mask that covers your whole face, you still smile. Children can see your your smile from your eyes and the expression on your face. Right. Um, and if you can, if possible, they have masks where you can either make them or buy them where it has the cutout so you can see um, your mouth moving or your mouth smiling um, at the children. That's I, I think that's ideal, but not totally necessary, but it, it would be nice for children to see even just for the positive climate and also the language aspect um, to see your mouth moving. Um, of course, continue to have lots of social conversations with the children, even at a distance and wearing a mask. Um, those can continue even virtually um, or across the classroom. They, those social conversations ask them what they've been doing, what they're interested in, what their favorite movie is, any any of those kinds of things to get into their world and also just to, to build that relationship and build that rapport with the children. Um, additionally, you can still, of course, show respect by using the children's names, giving them choices, giving them a responsibility, and that goes into regard to just giving them lots of flexibility and allowing them to move their own bodies um, and just using that warm, calm voice. Those, of course, don't require you to be close or doesn't matter if you're wearing a mask. Um, also, you can definitely join in their play from afar. So whether you're doing a dance party at circle time or you're um, playing in housekeeping and the one person's the cashier and one person's grocery shopping, um, or if you're outside and you're, you hop on a tricycle with the kids and you're riding around with them, you can still definitely join in their play. And also giving silly air high fives kiss air kisses um air hugs just make it fun make it silly and the children will know that you still care about them yeah i i agree i agree completely heather and one of the things that this question brings to mind to me is um is that is just that reminder that the behavioral markers in the class are meant to illustrate what the different indicators look like. Um, and so if we look at, um, you know, so if we're looking at positive affect, which is where the smiling piece comes in, well, again, we may not be able to see the teacher smile, but I actually tested this out. I, I put on my mask, went in front of the mirror, smiled, and I could actually see, my, now my mask is a little tight, tighter fitting and you know my cheeks moved and my eyes crinkled and um, and if you do the ones with the cutout and that has that plastic in there um, the kids can see they can see those things so we don't want to get stuck on on behavioral markers um, you know teachers could show um, their interest in kids by nodding at them nodding their head to show that they're listening and that um, that they're interested in the children and we may not again see the face break out in peals of laughter but we can hear laughter um, and Heather gave some great examples of some ways to, to do some um, positive communication which can also be an enthusiasm again we may not um, we can still hear what people are saying although we also have to recognize that it's a little harder to hear when people are wearing masks mm -hmm. And also I'm looking at this picture on our screen and you can tell that this teacher with this child is smiling just because of her eyes, as Sarah mm -hmm. was saying, um, smiling with the children. I'm also thinking like, have the children draw funny, silly smiles on their masks or on mm -hmm. your masks, make it fun. Mm -hmm. um, 
the children will eventually get into it once it becomes a new norm. Yeah. And that's something that we'll, that we need to think about in terms of, um, of behavior management and productivity. Um, for those, for the majority of you who are familiar with the class, is just being really proactive about what our new rules are. These are our new routines, which I guess is a lead-in to the second question on the slide. Um, Liz, do you want me to go ahead and read it? Yeah. Before you do, I actually there was a couple of questions that came in that I thought um, I'll just throw in now. If, if it feels like they sort of fit. So one of them was um, Macy came out to say that infants and toddlers should be continued to be held. What are your thoughts? Mm -hmm. And the other one was uh, specifically around working with toddlers. Um, you know, do you have any specific recommendations? Um, in, in terms of the infants, and someone po posted this on the class community the other day, so I didn't come up with this idea, but. Um, yeah, one of the things I talked about was masks and um, and maybe having um, more PPE covering the body. Um, but you know, you can look at the you can hold the child close, but while you're feeding, but you know, turn your head away a little bit. Um, you know, so you, so that you know you're still very close to that baby, but you might not be as intently looking as you might be. So you might turn your head a little bit. Um, to to have that that closeness because Nacy's absolutely right we can't take care of our youngest children and not be in physical proximity with them. Um, yeah. yeah, one person chimed in that she um, their program is using face shields, the clear plastic kind, mm -hmm. um, yeah. and can still see out see their faces. And that's and that's great if if your organization has the the funds and can access those face shields, that's probably really the best way to go about this. Because um, um, what I can tell mm -hmm. is more distorted as it is with the mask mm -hmm. uh, and kids can see you um, and it just gives you more protection. I've also, yeah, I've also just seen like the DIYs where you have like a headband and you make like the like plexiglass front, um, just like mm -hmm. to make it yourself. Or even I've seen like on Amazon, they have like, these little face shields that it's just like a clear mask that just covers your mouth and your nose so you can still see the children um and they can see your face but yeah i totally agree infants and toddlers are definitely still need that physical contact and that that is very hard i have a toddler myself and trying to keep him six feet away from people is near impossible um <laughs> so heather do should we try the next questions i was going to say the same thing even my four-year-old we mm -hmm. have practiced with grandparents keeping a distance and keeping a mask on and it takes a lot of practice this is a very new uh set of behaviors to learn and so any suggestions for that yeah, yeah so think, sarah do you ahead. want to tackle this no i'll let you start please oh, okay okay so um i'm just thinking about in the classroom like making this the normal as far as yeah making it fun so making and into art projects, even having um, just like pretend masks and housekeeping, like you could put them on, the children could do it even for animals or for baby dolls, just as that pretending. And I think just the children having, like I've thought about this for my son a lot. Um, he is close to turning two and once he's two, he has to wear a mask. So I'm just already planning for like one minute at a time at home, just starting to put it on and get used to it. Um, once he turns two and just make it fun and make it silly is the best thing I can think of. Um, also just having um, clear expectations for the children frequently remind it's going to take a lot of reminding with these new with this new normal. And I think even just like we as adults need the reminders of the stickers on the floor at Walmart. So I think the children will need the same thing in the classroom. Um, yeah. Also just like reading types of books like how do dinosaurs get well soon? Um, any books about germs and sickness just to help them understand what's going on so that they're, they're not afraid, I think is one of the best ways that we can introduce them to this new normal. Mm -hmm. I agree with everything um, you, you said, Heather, and you know, some places are continuing to serve children right now, and so they're already doing that. If there's anyone on this call who's already, who is continuing to serve children, we'd love to hear um, through the chat box some of the things that you've done to help establish these new routines. Um, 
but for people who are kids are going to be coming back to school it, it really is it's it's teaching brand new this is this is how it's going to work we um i know every state has is going to have different guidelines um here in virginia um, where we are i think that it's, it's no more than 10 children um so it's a little bit easier to social distance than if you are just going as business as usual but teaching new routines do a unit on hand washing and as heather said make it fun make it silly come up with new new hand washing songs and routines um because that's going to be a really big part of what you're doing um you'll have hand sanitizing stations that again you teach them about um so that it's yeah and I think uh, before we move on to the next question, just also saying, you know, we're here to sort of talk about maintaining relationships and quality interactions. Certainly follow what your you know, organization and your state recommends as far as safety protocol. I know a couple of people have chimed in about concerns about different levels of safety, different types of masks. Um, you know, that's the tricky part of all of this, that, you know, there's some areas where numbers are really low and there's probably a, a different feeling of safety than other areas where cases are high or you're with a high risk population of students um, so we certainly um, want you to follow your own uh, state guidelines and you know follow the cdc recommendations um, we just also know that we can have quality interactions during doing those things um, yeah let's uh Tackle this next one. I so, have to have one more idea that I just thought about because that I want to chime in. Um, so I was thinking back to my my preschool teaching days, and even even on a normal basis, to, teachers are cleaning toys in the classroom on a weekly basis or whenever your schedule is. And one of the most favorite activities of my kids was on Fridays, I would let them help me clean the toys. So like I would turn the water table into that washing table. So they would have their own rags and their own dish soap and they would wash like the pretend dishes and the food. So just adding that in, even as like a new normal of cleaning the classroom toys frequently, get the children involved, they'll love it. Even toddlers, preschoolers, they're both gonna love washing dishes and playing in the water with soap. All right, so we also had a number of programs who um, either haven't returned or are planning not to return for a little while and are still trying to meet with students and families remotely. Um, so this one says, my students are at home, but I meet with them for 20 minutes twice a week over Zoom. Any suggestions for how to have high quality interactions and main, uh, re maintain a relationship with my children that way? Wow. Heather, were you going to start that one or was I? <laughs> I feel like I stole your last one, so if you want to start this yeah. one. <laughs> yeah, so, um, fair enough. Um, so if you're only meeting with kids 20 minutes twice a week over Zoom, you really want to make the most of that time. Um, and so make sure that you greet every child when um, as they pop up on the screen or if you're meeting with if they're meeting with them as a group, if you're meeting with them individually, you have a conversation and find out what they've been up to, what they're doing. Find out, even if you've got your entire class, what's going on, how are you feeling, what are you doing while you're staying at home? Anything you can do to show that you are interested and invested in those in in your in the children um, in your class um, and. Yeah, I mean, we can think about it. We, we live in a, in a very virtual world right now. And, you know, all of us, I'm sure, have been on Slack or Zoom or FaceTime and we're talking to our friends and we're doing the same things we would do when we are um, when we're together. We're having social conversations. We're responding to their cues. We're looking and noticing if someone seems excited or unhappy and we're responding about that. Um, so it's it's really the same thing. It's just that you've got this. Barrier of a computer screen and distance um, between you. Yeah, and to add on to that, um, I actually talked to a coworker at Teachstone that has a child that is um, participating in this like Zoom meeting type of situation um, for just like a, a circle time kind of thing um, twice a week. 
And she said like the most effective things that the teachers have been doing is singing songs that involve the children, like what shirt color they're wearing and doing funny things like silly sock day, silly hat day, crazy hair day. And also just that, as Sarah said, naming each child and greeting each child individually has been the most effective. And um, I think even those teachers have taken the time to just take 10 minutes to call each child um, once every couple of weeks just to talk to them individually and ask them what what they've been doing and just how they're how they're doing and just having that one emotional connection with that child at a time has really made an impact and continued that relationship yeah i think so too and for older kids i mean we're hearing about um classrooms setting up their own facebook groups for example so be a little bit older kids um and preschoolers but setting up their own facebook groups um we really can st still not underestimate the power of snail mail um so postcards especially if you have um pictures from your classroom you know going online to one of those sites that whose names i can't remember anymore shutterfly or something like that get postcards made up that have pictures of all the kids on them send them out i'm thinking about you those kinds of little things will make a big difference um, in terms of helping maintain that relationship Right before you said that, Sarah, one of our attendees, Denise, said, suggested snail mail. She said yeah. that she sent home a couple learning activities one month apart and that the children loved it. And um, my own children's teachers both did that and, and it meant it meant a lot to them for sure. I'm also going to put in a, a plug here for Liz, who uh, wrote a blog post that the days all flow together, everybody, but she recently wrote a blog, blog post about the virtual learning um, that her daughter's involved in, and it was just really nice, and, sh and the teachers are gracious enough to give her permission to post some of their videos. So it's worth taking a look if you want to see a little bit more about how that can work well. Yeah, thanks. Um, and even, sorry. sorry. Do you do more, Heather? I keep cutting you off. I'm sorry. I'm just so excited. No, no, you're fine. You're fine. I'm even thinking like this isn't only it if it isn't only even just children but even like keeping the teachers connected um mm -hmm. as in like such a way that the content team that i work on at teach stone like we once a week we have a new photo prompt of like post a picture of a red flower that you see on a walk just to like start conversation and to build that um connectedness and relationship even while we're separated as a team um, even something like that, like post a picture of your favorite teddy bear, take a picture of a, a bug you see outside is really just ways to keep the children connected with one another and the teachers. Yeah. Yeah. I hadn't heard that your team was doing that. I think that's great. It's it's great. Yeah. Or like take a picture of your desk area or um, something that has become a new routine. We've done lots of photo prompts since this, since we've been working from home. That's fun. I like that. Um, okay. So, and we've also had a couple of questions along this line come into the, the chat. Um, so hopefully this will address some of them, but a common question is from the observer standpoint of programs are opening, but either they're not allowed to enter the room or they're not sure they should enter the room or, um, you know, they might have to enter, but really only stay in one spot, which we don't normally do when observing a classroom. Um, and so what is the guidance on either coaching without entering the room or coaching or observing um, using remote or, or video footage? Okay. That is, a, that's the, um, uh, that's a big question right now. And I'm going to um, grab this one from the, at least parts of it. Um, in terms of observing, we are in the process uh, as an organization of putting out some statements about observing um, during these times and what that might look like. Um, and, um, and, you know, one of the things we've been talking about a lot is that we do have places, and I know we have some people from Maine here. Maine doesn't have very many cases of, of COVID-19, um, but, and so, what it might look like for them may be just a pretty much like it always looks um, because they haven't been, most of the communities in Maine have not been hit very hard by this, by this pandemic. Um, I think about Virginia, which is um, 
a fairly rural state in many ways, and we've got places in Virginia where they haven't seen a single case. Yet we go up to Northern Virginia, um, the DC area, where it's been just horrible. And in fact, that part of our state uh, requested to the governor to open up later than the other parts of the state because they were so concerned about spreading the virus. Um, and so how people approach that is gonna be really, really different. Um, so we will be putting out some guidance about that. Um, so I would uh, say stay tuned, and I know that uh, we'll definitely have it on social media when we do, and I know the class, the class that Liz will put it in the class community as well. Um, Heather, do you want me to talk about coaching too? Sure. Okay. Yeah, I can talk about the aspect if we want to get into that too. You can talk talk about what? I'm sorry, you broke up. The video, videoing classrooms for coding. Okay. Um, so why don't I'll I'll start talking about coaching and then we'll I'll segue to you so you can talk about the video aspect because you know a lot about that. Um, <laughs> and and so um, for those of you who are more familiar with with Teachstone, um, you know that our our signature coaching program is called My Teaching Partner, um, which is a remote coaching program and. Um, it was uh, developed at the University of Virginia um, and in 2004, and so from 2004 to 2006, we did our first coaching with that, and um, and we coached teachers, um, early childhood teachers across the this Commonwealth of Virginia, and um, we we met the teachers in the very, very beginning when we went out to do orientation, um, but it was really pretty fleeting. Um, yet um, we found through the research that it was a very effective way of um, of building relationships and on coaching people. And we did that um, through the power of video as well as through the power of video. So teachers videotaped themselves, they sent them in. Um, to a coach at the university. We looked at those videos through the lens of the class. We picked out segments. It was a strength-based approach program. We picked out segments um, that we clipped, and then we posted them to a secure website um, for each teacher who could then look at the, the, the video clips and respond to prompts. Um, and then we met, and that was all online, but then we also met, um, so this was kind of in the early days of video conferencing through iChat. Um, and at this point, we've cut, we've literally coached thousands and thousands of teachers, um, and as have others uh, through video. Oh, Heather, you want to talk about the video its piece itself? Yeah. So if um, if your organization does go down the route of videoing the classrooms to either provide coaching or observing. Um, just some tips for the video aspect, as far as if you're using like a cell phone. Definitely keep it on um, lock orientation so it's it doesn't flip while you're videoing. Um, if you have access to a better camera than a cell phone that can, can continuously record for the length of the cycle, um, so at least 20 minutes for pre-K, 15 minutes for infant, um, then that would be best. But if not, in segments would be okay if it's if it's actually um, continuous as far as placing the segments together for coding. Um, if you're using a cell phone, turn it on, do not disturb so that no calls or texts come through while you're observing. Um, try to keep the teacher, um, teacher in the children's faces on camera as much as possible and stand away from anything loud, like the air, like an air conditioning unit, a sink, or, um, like a loud radio, radio playing in the classroom, but try to keep it close enough so you can hear the teacher and children and if possible use um, a lavalier mic it's just one of those little mics you clip on to a teacher um, so that you can hear what she's saying to the children and place it down lower usually we place it on um, the teacher's hip so that the te the children can also be heard on the cam on camera on the microphone um, and then just make sure you have enough footage for the four cycles or six cycles, whichever one you're doing to code or coach. Coaching is completely different. You don't need that much. Um, but just to make sure that you can see the teacher's faces and get as close as possible um, 
safely within six feet if you're doing center time um, to see the teacher and children playing together. Yeah. Um, thank you, Heather. Um, I'd also add that um, I, I talked with a woman last week and in her program, they're dropping off iPads um, mm -hmm. for classrooms and um, giving them a little stand that they can hold on to. So the teachers are responsible for turning the iPad on and off. And then at the end of the week, um, the coaches are going around and picking up um, this equipment. And then you know, after they've, mm -hmm. they've uploaded the video and you know, disinfected, uploaded, disinfected again, they're dropping them off for new teachers um, so that they can keep that coaching ongoing without having to go into the classroom. Um, are the teachers themselves, um, are they videoing themselves or is someone else holding the camera to capture transitions and I, like I think in this organization, I believe it's the teachers themselves. They're not supposed to have anyone else in the room. Um, but I know um, that administrators who can also go ahead and, and set that up. I would also add, because Heather brought up that transition point, if your teachers are videotaping yeah. themselves, first you want to give them really clear written guidelines. Um, and TeachStone has some, which we, we will be putting out. Um, um, so you need clear written guidelines. You want teachers to do a test video first um, to make sure that they're actually capturing themselves and not, you know, capturing something else. Or maybe they've captured, you know, you can see the teacher from, but well, you can't see from here to here, you know, what you don't see there. That's kind of a problem. Um, and um, also Heather mentioned uh, being able to see the faces of both the teacher and the and the children. Um, we got uh, some footage from um, an international site and they um, they took us very seriously in terms of having the teacher and the children all in the frame but the teacher was all the way up at the front of the room and it was just rows and rows of kids and the backs of their heads and so we couldn't see any children's facial expressions so there's a, there's more as video as Heather pointed out than just turning on a camera yeah like in that situation with rows of children and a teacher in the front, it would be ideal to stand on the side so you can see at least half the children and the teacher's face. Um, so you can see them facing her, but then every once in a while, like pan so you can see the other children. Um, that would be ideal. But if possible, it's best for someone else to video the teacher. If, if the administrator can come into the classroom and video to make sure that everyone's on camera and captures those transitions, that would be the best case scenario. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I had a thought now it's just gone completely out of, oh, I know it came back to me. Um, so one of the th other things I would say, um, especially if you're new to this kind of coaching, is, is to really, uh, especially in these times, to really focus on that strength based because teachers are going back into, um, into, into classrooms and it's a new world and so it's stressful for them it's stressful for the children um, i mean by the time school starts here in in september we're talking about march april may june july the kids will have been out of school for five and a half months and so and we don't know what what kids or teachers have been going through during this time maybe maybe they've been fine but maybe they've been impacted you know directly in their family by by um, someone having having the disease or maybe they've been impacted by the economic crisis or maybe they've been impacted by um, the social injustice that um, injustice that we're experiencing right now so we want to make sure that just as we want teachers to be very responsive to the children in the classroom, we want our coaches to be really responsive and and do that strength-based work because this is probably not the time to um, point out what somebody didn't do when, gosh, they're doing their absolute best in a really tough situation. Mm -hmm. It's really gonna be like building, building that house with the foundation of being emotional support, especially for, there may be some kiddos starting preschool or starting or the kids starting kindergarten that have, haven't been in a school situation before and this is going to be entirely different so really really building that relationship and having tons of sensitivity is going to be key in these first in these first few months right 
and and that makes me think about you know people doing observations and you know if kids are wearing masks we're much less likely to see you know that look of conf you know we were not going to see them yeah. frown um, but pay attention to those eyes that are going or look to see if a child's shoulders are slumped in or a child puts their head down on the table so think about other ways to be aware of the child's emotions besides what we used to be able to see very clearly um, i was going to add um and i apologize if one of you mentioned this but then i'll just say it again that in the manuals um in chapter two there is a section on video video saved observations that has a little bit of a breakdown of procedure and um i have shared a couple of the bullet points that heather walked through in the clc but i can also share them in the email follow-up that goes out after this um there was a question about that the type of microphone you mentioned heather a, a lavalier microphone is what it's called yeah. um but i can send those in the follow-up um, we also had um, Lori shared something that's working um, or that they're doing in their program. Um, they're delivering Kindle Fires, which is like a, you know, Amazon's brand of uh, iPad, much cheaper. That's what my kids have. You can get them on uh, Prime Day. Um, so they've delivered those to their teachers to set up a Zoom meeting and the teacher connects and they observe just watching through the Zoom meeting. Um, not for class observations, uh, but for coaching sessions. And so that's another sort of low cost way to be able to see what's happening in the classroom and give some feedback without really ever going in. And I also, I would also say that the, the power of that relationship between the coach and the teacher is, is just gonna be so critical. And so working, if it's a new teacher uh, working to build that relationship first, if it's a teacher you've worked with, you still want to, you know, fortify it because of the stressors that all of us have been been through in in, in varying um, degrees. Yeah, sure. and even like newer newer iPhones or newer phones in general, you can do Zoom meetings on those and buy a super cheap um, tripod off Amazon to if, to situate that. If that's even that's an even cheaper option um, for teachers that have cell phones already that have the capability to do Zoom on them as just buy a super, super cheap tripod to set up um, so that coaches can watch and have a coaching session with them in the classroom. Perfect. Um, and I move us on. So this is one I think is probably always relevant. You know, <laughs> teaching is uh, an incredibly hard profession any time of the year, uh, even without a pandemic. But specifically now, do you guys have any suggestions for um, for coaches and for leaders to help their teachers with self-care and self-compassion um, and those specifically that are struggling. Yeah, so I definitely think like, this is just kind of gonna be like, we call it the parallel process. So teachers treating children, um, using the class, using class interactions, looking looking at class interactions, using respect, using positive communication, um, using positive affect and sensitivity. I think it's just gonna be this, it's going to be kind of the same thing. So hopefully administrators and coaches can come in with the same mindset that we want to see teachers treating children. We want to see the same same thing from coaches and administrators. So just being compassionate and understanding. We don't a lot of a lot of teachers and everyone honestly is going through this difficult time and everyone can use a little bit of extra compassion. So just giving the teachers frequent breaks if you can to just remove their mask and just breathe. That would be that would be amazing. And that, I think that would help teachers in general and just being flexible to if they have children at home that aren't back in childcare or if they have children that are starting school for the first time. So just just giving them that time if you can and being flexible. Um, if there are any kind of mental health benefits available through the company pointing them to that and just even do, doing frequent check-ins um so yeah. at teach Don't, for example we meet one-on-one -on -one with each other um once a week with our direct 
supervisor and we even if it's just for 15 minutes just how are you doing is there anything i can help you with that's exactly what we do and that's it it helps a ton because it just it builds that emotional connection and that trust and that respect of just i need help with this um so just building that relationship and being sensitive mm -hmm. yeah and when you talked heather about um you know just stepping outside the room for five minutes it reminds me of a teacher um a preschool teacher i i coached in a, a research study a number of years ago and um first i'll tell you that her name was mrs cudley which is the best name that any preschool teacher could ever have. Um, and Mrs. Cudley also, um, in her district, she was known as being really good with kids who were really tough. And so her classroom tended to have a lot of kids who had more emotional needs or special education needs than your typical um, uh, uh, state-funded pre-k program and um she had the same the same assistant um year in and year out which was a blessing for both of them but they had a signal they just had this this silent signal or it might have been a word but they had a signal that they would give each other that said i need a break um and the other one would immediately they had contingency plans and that whether it was mrs cudley or um or Miss, Miss Mandy were able to just step out of the room for a few minutes, um, take a deep breath, um, maybe walk around the parking lot, but it, it really did seem to be very helpful for them as they struggled with kids who were having lots of issues. And um, for many of us, um, many of you, because I'm not in direct service anymore, but um, many of you are gonna see some kids who've had some really tough experiences um, and, um, and we don't know what's going to trigger those memories for them. Um, so yeah, so really being sensitive and aware and, and having an escape kind of valve. Um, I also can think about if you're doing professional learning communities, you're having mental health being part of what you're talking about and not in, not in terms of I'm going to be a therapist but just terms about like like how are you holding up what are you doing to take care of yourselves um, I used to um, teach for a school district and they um, they set up free aerobics classes for teachers and staff um, every week so that we could just burn off some energy and be with our colleagues outside of the school environment um, and those those were helpful th helpful things. I I'm curious what kind of things other people um, who are on this call have been thinking about in terms of self care and and support for teachers. I haven't seen any uh, come in, but I will share if I see some. Um, I know we're going to run out of time. There's so many good questions that have come in. Um, know that I'm, I've copied all of them into a document for myself and, and my plan is that we obviously won't be able to, to answer them all, um, in the next five minutes or so. Um, but we'll, I'll compile them and put them in the class learning community and, and either Sarah or Heather or someone from TeachStone will, will certainly be able to help, um, answer those. And I think getting feedback from what others are doing is great as well um one of the things that that's come up sarah you had mentioned that teach zone is planning on putting out some guidance around this and um, there were questions of do you know roughly when is it is it weeks is it months <laughs> it's it's definitely not months it's definitely not months um i mean i it's just as soon as we can get it out the door um and in addition to thinking about guidelines um for conducting observations we're also generating ideas of how things might look um, in in the age of, of COVID-19. Um, so um, this, it's at the forefront of people's minds. So it's definitely not going to be months. And um, I think that um, some folks would not like it to even be two weeks. Um, yeah, soon, soon. <laughs> um, I'm trying to think of what else we can can get to quickly. Um, 
So a, a couple of questions that seem similar would be, um, some have concern of parents um, feeling un either uncomfortable sending their kids back or they're, the parents don't like the idea of sending you know, their three or four year old with a mask. Um, and these children, if they do come, are likely going to need more comfort. You know, I know my own four year old normally has gone to a childcare person since he was born, really, and now has spent every day for the last five months with me. And, and leaving the next time he leaves will be hard. Um, and so, sort of a two part of how do we educate parents that this can be safe and can be appropriate and um, that kids are resilient enough to, to wear masks and be okay. And, and also how can we comfort um, the children when they return, especially if we're trying to maintain some distance. Tricky questions, sorry. <laughs> no, don't be sorry. What'd you say, Sarah? Oh, I said not, for Liz not to apologize. Um, do you have some thoughts, Heather? Yeah, I think again, just building that comfort and trying to get trying to get parents on board before the children um, go back to school would probably be best case scenario around the masks. Um, maybe encouraging them to talk to their pediatricians at their next visit about it, um, just to build that that comfort and again having the children just get used to the masks at home before they go back to school and buying them fun masks like I have I have a llama mask like just making it fun my mom has a Dr. Seuss mask she was a preschool teacher too so just making it some kind of something that the children aren't going to despise <laughs> honestly just get them to be as comfortable with it as possible it's it's a tough time for sure yeah. and parents and think, model wearing masks as well yeah yeah mm -hmm. and as far as um you know comforting children that are upset i think you know there's been a conversation around this in the clc as well of you know i don't think anyone's recommending you don't comfort a crying toddler um you know toddlers are still going to need hugs and um, and still need comfort. And if you can wear your mask while the toddler's upset um, and show that you're comfortable and that they can be comfortable, um, I, I think everyone would, would agree that that is probably necessary. Um, and I think like Heather, I um, have found, <laughs> you know, for my own children that just finding opportunities to have them wear masks to sort of so slowly, um, just make it, you know, normalized that you know you can have fun with grandma while wearing a mask, or we get to go into the ice cream store only if you wear a mask, um, mm -hmm. and and finding ways that it can feel, um, you know, like a positive element. Yeah, I'd also say reassuring um, parents about um, what you're doing to maintain safety and sanitation is going to be really important um, so that they feel reassured that you're doing your best but i also do i i agree with both heather and and liz that um you also i think if i had a young child um i would be a little hesitant to send to send um my child off if i thought that oh my gosh they, they fall down on the playground and they skin the knees and the teacher's not even going to hug them and comfort them, um, but explain that you know we're not hugging as a as a general rule, but we are doing our best to comfort children um, when they are upset and um, or or if they're hurt, um, so that people know that their children's needs are being met. Um, mm -hmm. The post that I saw, I think it was in the CLC um, the other day, um, talked about having a, a change of clothes, for example, for the teacher. Um, so that if a child, you know, cries on their shoulder and, you know, a skull is, you know, mucus is on <laughs> your shoulder, that, you know, they can they can change their clothes and put on clean clothes um, and having change of clothes for kids as well. Um, 
which we all do anyway in preschool. Mm -hmm. Always. Um, I am aware we have only seven minutes left, so I want to just talk a little bit about where you can find some of these resources that that Heather and Sarah have mentioned throughout, and um, assure you that we'll we'll um, both email the slides and the recording, um, but as well as some of these resources. So if you haven't been to just our regular teachzone.com website, um, you'll find some of the things we've talked about. Right now we have free access for anyone to some of the My Teach Stone learning resources. If you haven't taken advantage of that, I highly recommend it. There's a drop down on the website that says COVID resources and you um, are given a activation code and act can activate um, a set of free learning resources. Um, on the website, there's also blog posts. There's a number of blog posts specific to um, this this time. The one Sarah mentioned that I wrote is the most recent one, but there's lots of them about, um, Sarah's written a number of wonderful ones as well about using music at home and supporting families both at home. There was a one specifically around coaching remotely, which it sounds like a number of you have questions on. Um, and there's just a plethora of, of resources um, out there on our website. So I'd recommend taking a look at those. Um, if you didn't hear about this from the class learning community, um, I recommend joining or logging in. Anyone can have free access to the CLC by um, going to this website at the bottom there. Um, many of you, if you're an observer or have any sort of um, training you've gone through, likely already in there and see my name. <laughs> possibly too much, um, but I recommend it. And, and this is where I will post a lot of the questions we weren't able to get to and, and um, hear what others have to say and, and get teach stone answers as well. Um, and I'm very excited to share this. You guys are actually like the first group I have shared this with, uh, other than other teach stone staff. We are launching a, our first ever teacher specific summit. Uh, Interact Now Teacher Summit. It will be August 4th and 5th. This is just a save the date. Registration is not even open yet. But if you go to teachstone.com slash teacher summit, you'll see a little bit about it and um, be able to enter your email if you want more updates. Um, we're hoping to launch registration very soon. Um, and uh, it will be a virtual summit. So from the safety of your home, you can access um, all of the recordings afterward and learn over the two days from really uh, a wide range of experts. So highly recommend that. Um, and a shout out for another virtual uh, learning opportunity we have. Um, this is our brand new class foundations course for teachers. You can learn about it uh, also on our website. Um, you can choose one or all four of um, online courses that are, um, oh, my bullet point at the bottom there is out of date. It is launched, you can, you can start it now. Um, and so I recommend for all the teachers on the call, uh, taking a look at that. There's some really great content for those who are newer to class, um, but also anyone that sort of needs a refresher specific to instructional support or classroom organization or or the whole class system. Um, and that is all we have. And I apologize to those of you whose questions we didn't get to. Um, but like I said, we have them written down and uh, we'll try to get the conversations going around them over the next couple of days in the class learning community. Um, and you can always find us in there. Uh, Heather or Sarah, any last words? Thank you all for joining us today, and um, I wish you all the best as you go back, or if you're already there, continue to do this great work that you're doing, and um, stay safe, stay healthy. Yeah. All right, thank you, everyone. And yes, uh, the last couple of people asked about recordings. Um, you'll get an email tomorrow that has the recording and um, a certificate of attendance, and then I will send a separate email with um, some other resources. 
All right. Bye, everybody. Thanks so much. Thanks for us. Thanks, Heather. It was fun. Bye. Thanks. <laughs>